Hello, I'm Neil Clark, and in this talk we're going to look at enrichment. I'll start off by talking about uh, overrepresentation analysis, which is uh, chronologically speaking the the, the first um, uh, attempts towards uh, an analysis of enrichment. Uh, and so, in, in an overrepresentation analysis, it's a is a way of um, characterizing the composition of sets, typically of, of gene sets. So, uh, typically, um, an experiment might result in a particular set of genes, and the investigator might be interested in characterizing the, the composition of, of that gene set. For example the genes might have an associated uh, uh, categories such as the membership of a given pathway or um, have an associated gene ontology term for example and the investigator might want might be interested to know which of these categories are um, overrepresented in their in their gene set so we're going to look at a couple of statistical approaches to um, assessing that. So we're going to look at the hypergeometric test and the Fisher exact test. And then uh, building on this, um, uh, this idea of looking at relationships between sets, we're going to look at the, the, the Jacquard in index. So this analysis of overrepresentation has developed um, um, more recently, it's taken the form of uh, the analysis of the enrichment of gene sets. So this is um, a method of analyzing differential gene expression uh, instead of the, the gene level at a, the level of, of, a collection of, of collections of genes. And this has a number of um, advantages, some of them statistical, some of them uh, uh, sort of uh, to do with the interpretation of the, of the results, so we're gonna I'm gonna talk give a kind of a general formulation for this um, enrichment of gene sets before I go into um, uh, particular detail about one method, the, the method called gene set enrichment or GSEA. Overrepresentation analysis is uh, one of the earliest. Um, attempts at a kind of an enrichment analysis in in bioinformatics and it might be best for us to um, look at, at a, a specific example in order to understand what is what is going on here so let's take um, uh, an analysis from uh, Rash et al here the authors um, performed a, a meta-analysis over a number of studies to identify 213 genes which had an apparent association with type 2 diabetes. Now the authors of this study then asked the question, for a given keg pathway, let's look at these 213 genes and count how many of those 213 genes are members of this specific keg pathway. And then we're going to ask, is that number more than we'd, we'd, we would expect just by chance? Or, or is it about the same? If it's more than we would expect by chance, then this might lead us to conclude that this specific keg pathway is in some way relevant to, to the, uh, or dysregulated uh, in type 2 diabetes. Now, the, and, and then on the right, there's a, a kind of a, an illustration um, uh, of the results of this analysis. The authors tested all keg pathways in this way and identified all of those that are um, significantly overrepresented in their 213 genes. And these are illustrated in the figure on the right. Now, the, this, this, uh, the question of overrepresentation um, is a statistical one, and there are a number of different uh, statistical approaches to this. Um, we're going to look at um, 
uh, a couple of formulations of this problem. Uh, first, we're going to represent it as an urn model and use the hypergeometric test. And we can also look at the problem from the point of view of a Fisher exact test. So I, I will give a, um, a brief description of each of those two um, next. Some of the overrepresentation analyses uh, also tried to take into account um, the the magnitude of the differential expression, and this was done by producing a kind of a score, which was the product not only of the significance of the the p-value for each gene, but also um, the, the the fold change, and this was also part of this work uh, by Rash et al. So let's go on now and examine some of the, um, the statistical tests that are used in overrepresentation analysis. An alternative formulation uh, for the statistical test of overrepresentation is the fisher eggs act test. This test takes two categorical variables and tests whether there is a significant relationship between the two. It was inspired um, by uh, a claim by uh, um, a, 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 a Muriel Bristol that she could taste whether the milk was added before or after uh, the tea in a, in a teacup. Now Fisher was suspicious of this and devised a test to prove one way or another. So in this case, the two categorical variables are whether the milk was added first or second, so that's either yes or no, and whether Muriel Bristol, having tasted the tea, predicts that the milk was added first or second. Now if there is a relationship between the two, such that if Muriel Bristol says that the, uh, the milk was added first, and it often was, then this would kind of, uh, this could be proved or disproved with the, the Fisher exact test. So the, the way it works is by, um, uh, is based on uh, what's called a contingency table. So let's go back to our example of the keg pathways and our analysis of, uh, of whether a given gene set has an overrepresentation of this keg pathway. So our two categorical variables here are the a gene is a member of a keg pathway or it's not, and the gene is present in our gene set or it's not. And so one way to formulate the overrepresentation question is if the gene is a member of a keg pathway, is it then also more likely to be present in our gene set, or is there actually no relationship between those two? So we can write a contingency table for these two variables. So for each gene, we put it in one of four places. If the gene is a member of a keg pathway and present in our gene set, then the gene contributes to this part of the um, contingency table, for example. If the gene is not a member of this keg pathway, but it's still in our gene set, then it contributes here. So let's say, for example, of the 213 genes in our gene set, 100 of them are a member of some specific keg pathway, and the other 113 are not members of this pathway. So initially, we might think, wow, nearly half of our genes in our set are members of this keg pathway, it must be an important pathway. But if we if we perform the statistical test, then we can actually get a quantitative answer uh, to whether we should be um, uh, excited about this keg pathway or not. So let's complete the contingency table. Let's look at all those genes that are not present in our gene set and count how many of them are members of the keg pathway and how many are not members of the keg pathway? And a question. And let's say, just for simplicity's sake, we have a total of 20,000 human genes and 9,000 of them are 
members of the Kek Pakhoi, and 11,000 are not. This is very unrealistic numbers, I'll just put it in verse um, uh, to illustrate a point. And the point being that about, it's roughly speaking, a half, about half of the genes of all human genes are members of this pathway and half are not. And this is about the same proportion as we see in our gene set. So the, this contingency table is actually not very surprising. It, it would actually be quite likely to occur just by chance. Now, the, the actual probability of observing any particular contingency table is actually given by the hypergeometric distribution we saw in the previous slide. Under the Fisher exact test, we ask the question, what is the chance of seeing um, a, a particular difference in proportion here, which is of a particular magnitude or greater? And so with the Fisher exact test, we actually we perform this sum over the hypergeometric di distribution of all contingency tables, which are at least as extreme as the one that we observe. And the result is, um, uh, will give you a probability that um, uh, that there is that there is a uh, there is actually a relationship between the the, the the categorical variables and that indeed the keg pathway is either is either significantly overrepresented or not.